Thank you, Namrata. Let me just get my screen share. And, uh, Good morning, everyone. Um, I thought I would start today's session by taking a little peek into literature. And this is a painting from the famous poem by Milton, which is Paradise Lost. And I'm sure many of you are aware that this deals with devils fall from heaven. So the story goes that Satan basically spawns a daughter from his forehead. Her name is Sin. And then he proceeds to have an incestuous relationship with her from which is born a son death and just to make matters more interesting and more complicated death then proceeds to have an incestuous relationship with his court mother sister uncourt sin herself so milton says that these three entities and the various complex relationships that they have between themselves are responsible for most of the evils that mankind faces and he calls them the unholy trinity in the context of today's session, we are going to be talking about the ocular surface and we know that it's very important for the corneal and conjunctival epithelium to be healthy for us to have comfort and clear vision. And in order to do this, we have the tears and the mucus from the goblet cells and the lacrimal glands assisted by the oily stuff from the lids and the meibomian glands. And all of these work together to keep us happy and comfortable. Just like in Milton's poem, we do have an unholy trinity on the ocular surface as well. And they are the dry eye disease, inflammation, and mebomian gland dysfunction. And these three entities and their complex interrelationships are what result in most of the damage to the ocular surface. And I chose to call them the unholy trinity in the context of today's session. And our purpose is to deal in the next 20 minutes about how we can objectively assess the presence and impact of these elements on the ocular surface and the damage that they produce. Because as Namrata mentioned, the rest of the session deals with corneal regeneration. And in order to regenerate the cornea, we must first understand the degeneration that has set in. Dry eye disease is one of the three most rapidly growing eye problems in the aged and accounts for one out of four clinic visits to the ophthalmologist in the US. Based on literature, it appears that the prevalence of dry eye disease and mebomian gland dysfunction is more in elderly Asians. And in addition, with the increasing use of VDTs today, there is an increasing burden of disease in another subset of younger individuals, in addition to these elderly people that we are aware of already. These patients present to us with various symptoms, and when we we examine the ocular surface, we come up with various signs, and sometimes these two do not correlate. Therefore, the need for an objective assessment, because we can't depend entirely on the symptoms that the patient tells us alone. However, both are important because our goal is not just to treat the symptoms and make them comfortable, but we also have to do things to keep the ocular surface health maintained. I'm going to start with inflammation, and we know that Celsus gave us the cardinal signs, which were calor, dollar, rubber, and tumor. And in 1871, Virchow added the loss of function as well. And these are present when you have ocular surface inflammation as well. We see pain, redness, and swelling or edema. Heat is not so commonly seen because of the very small 2.2 square centimeter surface area of the ocular surface, which is exposed to the environment. And the loss of function initially is a fluctuation in vision, but with ongoing damage, we can have permanent vision loss as well. Now, interestingly, if you think about it, inflammation is actually a protective defense mechanism that is designed to protect the tissues that it works in. It is triggered by damage to the living tissues by insults such as infection or injury. And within the first 24 to 48 hours, the innate immune system steps in to help and destroy and remove this inciting agent and to repair the tissue that has been affected. If the symptom persists beyond 48 hours, however, the adaptive immune system is activated and the chief currency of this system is inflammation. And if it persists, there is a vicious cycle of chronic inflammation and the repeated attempts at healing that go on result in scarring with all its consequences to the ocular surface. In the context of dry eye, the presence and association of inflammation has been known for more than 40 years now, but it is only recently that we are truly understanding the complex interplay between these structures. And that is what I'm going to try and cover first. Based on the DUS2 definition, we know that hyperosmolarity and 
air film instability are considered to be the primary events that set up all of these changes on the surface. And these can happen either because of a decrease in the secretion of the aqueous tears or from an increased evaporation of the tears from the surface, which is where meibomian gland dysfunction comes in. And when you have an unstable tear film, the underlying epithelium, which is in close proximity, tends to get affected. And then it produces a response, which is chiefly the production of these stress-associated mitogen-activated protein kinases from the corneal epithelium. These kinases are then able to initiate the production of various inflammatory mediators. These bring in by chemotaxis the leukocytes and the lymphocytes, and the inflammatory cascade then begins. So most of it seems to start with the corneal surface epithelium, which is why it is important to recognize it and the focus today on the corneal epithelial regeneration itself. A variety of conditions can result in these changes. You can have Jogren syndrome, other autoimmune conditions, graft versus host disease or Stevens-Johnson syndrome. These affect the lacrimal glands, which means there is less tear production and whatever tears are produced tend to be very inflammatory in nature. On the other hand, you can have surface elements like chronic contact lens use, medication toxicity, surgical trauma, or neurotrophy. These affect the nerves. Then the afferent arm of the feedback loop is affected and less tears are produced. Even if tears are on the surface, if you have significant meibomian gland dysfunction, a poor blink rate, chalasis, Parkinsonism, thyroid eye disease, or extensive video display terminal use, there is constant evaporation. And if this is aggravated by adverse temperature, humidity, and airflow, finally, the end result is desiccation and hyperosmolarity. And then this sets up and triggers all of the other changes that we shall see. So a variety of events can be happening on the surface to produce these damages. If you have a transient insult, like a toxic medication, and the acute protective inflammatory response is involved, if you can get rid of the inflammatory medication, the changes will disappear and you can quell everything very quickly. On the other hand, in dry eye disease, unfortunately, the stimuli, which is tear film hyperosmolarity and the friction related damage to the ocular surface tend to persist because you're not able to address the basic dry eye problem itself. And therefore, in time, the adaptive immune response and chronic inflammation come in. And after the initial cascade, a vicious self-perpetuating cycle develops, which can then maintain itself even if you try and remove the initial stimulus. Most of the patients who present to us with moderate dry eye, they have tear disturbance and inflammation coexisting. And the question, therefore, is which came first? If you look at it objectively, if you have epithelial cell damage from a tear problem, this initiates the inflammatory cascade, as I just said. And this inflammation then perpetuates the cascade and the inflammatory mediators and the cytokines come back and damage the epithelium, the goblet cells, the meibomian glands, and the nerves. And this results in a further tear film disturbance and eventually the two cycles will merge. So inflammation can be a cause and a concurrent element that is present in a dry eye disease. If we look at the actual events that happen on the surface, the epithelial cell produces interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, and matrix metalloproteinases. These help in recruitment of T helper cells 1 and 17, and these produce additional mediators like interferon gamma, tumor necrosis factor, and interleukins. And these cytokines are responsible for goblet cell and tear dysfunction, epithelial cell damage. They produce lymphangiogenesis, which makes it easy for these inflammatory mediators to go back and forth between the surface and the immune processing centers. And these are also responsible for the symptom of irritation that patients complain of. When the epithelial system is affected, it also produces envelope, corneal envelope precursors. And these are able to induce a keratinization of the meibomian gland orifices. These get blocked, and this recruits the meibomian gland dysfunction into this scenario where there's already dry eye disease and inflammation. So essentially, to summarize, the epithelial cell pathway is important because it produces the initial events, the inflammatory mediators. This results in goblet and tear cell dysfunction and dry eye disease. And the epithelial cell pathway is also responsible for recruiting the meibomian gland dysfunction into this process. So the epithelial cell damage seems to be an early and constant factor in this process that we are talking about. And therefore, it is, again, as I say, important to recognize the presence of damage to the epithelium and to do our best to heal it so that we can try and short-circuit some of these bad things that are happening on the ocular surface. 
We talked about the unholy trinity and their interrelationships. If you have dry eye disease, it produces epithelial damage, which as I said, the damaged epithelium produces inflammation and then induces meibomian gland keratinization. If you have inflammation on the other hand, it worsens epithelial damage, then comes dry eye and meibomian gland disease. Or if you start with meibomian gland dysfunction, there is tear film instability, which results in inflammation, epithelial damage. And so all three basically go hand in hand. And if they persist for any length of time, they become one large vicious cycle, which is self-perpetuating, where each feeds off the other, much like in the poem by Milton itself. So you have inflammatory, this is the cycle. You have the dry eye disease cycle. You have the meibomian gland disease dysfunction. They are all interrelated. So this causes adds on to both of these, this adds on to both of these and so on. So it is very important to recognize each of these elements and try and treat them as early and as effectively as possible. Because if you leave one behind, it gradually brings in the other two as well. So the, with all this, the question then is inevitable. This inflammation going to be always present in dry eye disease? Are we fighting a losing battle? Is it going to just hurt the surface no matter what we do? To answer this, in a recent 2020 paper, McMonies talked about the need to segregate dry eye risk factors into those that are modifiable, like the environment, where we can try and deal with it, or those that are non-modifiable, like age, where we just have to manage them because they can't be eliminated. By identifying these specific mechanisms driving the dry eye disease in individual patients, we will might be able to have a rational approach to the therapy itself. The other way to look at inflammation is to categorize it as surface inflammation, which is present on the surface epithelium, and the deeper inflammation, which is present within the lacrimal gland and the meibomian gland. If we understand this concept, this may explain why in many patients who come with inflammation, when we start them on treatment with maybe steroids and other agents, in the first week, there is a good response. The patient comes back feeling very happy. And if we don't understand the deeper component and if either the patient or us stop the therapy very early within a week or 10 days, they quickly come back with a recurrence of all these problems. And that is because of the persistent deeper inflammation in the lacrimal gland and the meibomian gland. This is a little more difficult to treat. It needs prolonged treatment. We need increasing concentration of the agents that we use and an increasing frequency of use in order to tackle this deeper inflammatory process. In untreated dry eye disease, because of the persistent stimulus, there is a self-perpetuating chronic inflammation. But if you can treat these patients early and correct the tear film instability, which is triggering all this problem, and correct the epithelial damage so the epithelium does not escalate everything and take care of the inflammation right at the start, you can heal the ocular surface and exit the patient from this one-way street. But you must recognize and treat these things appropriately at the earliest possible time. The other approach to this was described by Rolando et al. in a paper about three, four months ago, where they talked about the importance of looking at the patient's symptomatology. If the patient has symptoms only in response to specific events and they occur occasionally, he termed it sporadic. If it is in response to a specific insult, but happens little more frequently, he called it intermittent. On the other hand, if there is no specific trigger and patients have symptoms on most days, it is persistent. And if they have it all the time, it is permanent. He said that the importance of recognizing the symptom complex is because in the first two, you can try and exit the patient by paying attention to these factors. But if they have persistent or permanent symptoms in the absence of any specific inciting trigger, it probably means that they've already lost their compensatory mechanism, they've shifted into the vicious cycle. And here treatment is, limited, is concentrated more on damage control and maintenance of this chronic process. So we talked a lot about inflammation and its importance. So clinically, the relevance, how do we recognize its presence? We know that you have point of care tests like the tear lab for osmolarity, the inflammatory drive for MMP9 levels, and there are other evolving tests for other inflammatory markers. But these are generally not practical for day-to-day -day use in a general ophthalmology clinic. So clinically, you can look for the presence of ocular surface redness, and especially if it is associated with conjunctival edema, this is a significant sign of inflammation. Studies have shown that if you have staining of the conjunctiva with the lysamine green dye, it, it concurs with the presence of inflammatory markers and is a very specific and sensitive sign for the presence of inflammation. So also lip cough or lip parallel conjunctival folds, especially in the inferior temporal region. This is because inflammatory MMP9 causes a distribution of the subconjunctival stroma, produces a loosening of the conjunctiva, 
and in a dry eye when there is increased friction during blinking this loose conjunctiva is thrown into these folds so these three are the clinical signs that we can look at in these patients the redness can be just clinically categorized quickly and easily as mild moderate or severe based on your semi quantitative scaling or you can use the standard grading scales like the efron or the cclr you scale to quantify it or you can take a digital approach where you can basically digitize the picture and the pixels where the color is red can give you a quantifiable score itself the presence of lysamine green staining on the conjunctiva is important as far as inflammation is concerned and also documents the extent of epithelial damage and this is something that is cheap easy and inexpensive and all of us can do it as far as the tears are concerned you can measure quantitatively the height of the tear meniscus using an automated device or clinically you can use a shearmer to provide a surrogate measure the other aspect of tear function is the tear turnover itself it's not just the production of tears or the quantity or the quality but also the turnover and this is done using fluorescein tear clearance test but again this is something that's a bit cumbersome and you don't normally do it in a clinic situation where we limit ourselves to looking at the volume of tears for meibomian gland dysfunction we have to look at the anatomy of the glands the physiology in terms of the quantity and the quality of the secretion and the function basically it stabilizes the tear film therefore if it is not healthy then you can get a very short tear break up time so in this to assess the glands themselves you can do this at the slit lamp by picking the lid and looking at these yellow ridges and this is a very healthy meibomian gland structure or you could use infrared meibography to see this in greater detail This is a spring-loaded device, devised by Cobb and Blackie to produce a graded amount of pressure on the lid. But in the clinic, you could just as easily do this by using a thumb on the middle third of the lower eyelid and putting firm pressure. The thumb usually encompasses four or five meibomian gland orifices. And what we try and look at is how many of these orifices express oil when you push. What is the quantity of the oil and what is the quality of the oil? And this gives you an idea of the physiology. we can lipid interferometry to measure the thickness of the lipid on the surface of the tear film to give you an idea of its functionality or you could use something like a non invasive break up time which is considered more physiological because you're not adding fluorescein and a solution onto the surface to measure break up time but again this requires the use of a device so when we talk about objective measures they are useful but their evaluation is become infinitely complex like i said nibut tear meniscus height and lipid interferometry all need a sophisticated device as often does lipid uh, in, in infrared meibomography and to look at and grade the redness itself and to get a score there are devices available which can do all of this and give you a very nice composite report like this so basically if this marker is in the red it is abnormal if it is in the yellow it is suspicious and if it is in the green it is normal so it gives you a nice picture you can tell the patient what is going on but of course this comes at a cost the clinic which may not have access to all this. you can try and do these things instead you can get a symptom score using the osdi or the ocular surface disease index you can grade the clinic ocular redness clinically do a fluorescein break up time and as long as you do it in a repeatable manner you do get useful information and the staining fluorescein for the cornea and lysamine for the conjunctiva can be very useful the shermer for the tear volume and the meibomian gland assessment as i just mentioned and this will give you a composite picture of the various objective parameters but no matter you get them automated way or in a clinical way there is at the as yet no single gold standard dry eye sign or symptom although clinical evaluation is possible and efficient we must be aware of the sensitivity and the specificity of the test that we use and that the numbers that you get there is a significant overlap between the normals and the dry eye patients with regards to these test results and therefore if you want to segregate these two categories better more metrics must be used once you have a measure of the mucus the aqueous and the lipid performance you can put them together to say whether the patient is normal whether he has an aqueous deficiency dry eye an evaporative dry eye or a combination of the both and to on top of this you look for the presence of inflammation you look for the presence of ocular surface staining and the various other conditions which i showed you in an earlier slide which may be present and aggravating the situation on the ocular surface So these objective tests help us to detect the presence of changes on the ocular surface. They help you in categorizing the type of disease which is present. They help you to document the changes and therefore grade the severity as mild, moderate, or severe for that particular disease. And by knowing the type of disease and the severity, you can rationally choose the therapy for that particular patient. And when they come back after treatment, you can use these objective tests to sequentially monitor the progress of the disease.
We spoke about the disconnect between symptoms and signs. So sometimes you may have a patient with extreme symptomatology in whom the Schirmer is normal and there is no fluorescein or lysamine green skin in the surface. But if they have an extremely short BUP, they fall into what is called the short BUP dry eye with the Japanese and the Asia dry eye society are seeing a lot of in their patients. And this may be responsible for a significant patient symptomatology. On the other hand, if you have patient symptoms which are extensive, but you have a normal Schirmer, no staining, and the BUP is also normal, we may be de dealing with neuropathic pain, which often happens in a surgically mutilated cornea or a surgically traumatized cornea because of the nerves that are amputated and then they regenerate in a normal manner. And I guess we're going to be hearing a lot about this in the next talk because there is talk about corneal regeneration after corneal refractive surgery, which is one of the situations where you may see this. So to basically conclude, the objective tests are important because patient symptoms can vary. There's a bit of a psychogenic component there. Whereas with objective tests, you know what is happening on the surface and in conjunction with symptoms, you can use these to aid the management of these patients with a disturbed ocular surface. The tests can be done manually or automated. The difference is the time, the cost, the precision, and the fact that the automated tests are generally non-contact itself. However, staining is something that remains an extremely important process this because all it requires is a one rupee fluorescein strip. And if you have a blue filter and a green filter on your split lamp, you can use that itself to assist the conjunctiva also without lysamine. And no matter what the disease process that is affecting the surface, no matter what the pathway is, no matter the presence of inflammation, dry eye or mevomian gland dysfunction, ultimately the damage to the surface is the final common outcome of these diverse processes. And staining picks up that particular damage based on which you can assess the disease presence, severity, and then the treatment approach that you want to take. We do have point of care tests that are available already and which are still evolving for various markers on the surface, but as yet the role in routine clinical evaluation is unclear because of the cost that is involved with these processes. So that's pretty much what I had to say about my talk and I'm going to just now have the next talk um, which is going to be given by Professor Kim. Uh, Professor Mee Kum Kim is from the College of Ophthalmology and Medicine at the Seoul National University. She has a specialty interest in cornea, in corneal regenerative medicine, in ocular immunity, transplantation, dry eyes, and ocular surface disease, and therefore is very eminently suitable for what we are going to be speaking about today. She has extensive publications in very, very prestigious journals like the Journal of Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine, the American Journal of Transplantation, the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, and of course, the